Christ, be our light. Shine through us. Shine for us. Help us to be your light in this world. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Have you ever experienced a severe disruption in your life? Some event occurs and it catapults you into a place you have never been before. A place you would never have chosen to go. Life as you knew it and counted on it drastically changed. Some tragic event either suddenly occurs or unfold slowly with excruciating impact. A daughter is murdered. A friend is diagnosed with cancer and dies within a few weeks. A young, healthy father with no problems ever sets out on an endurance swim and his heart inexplicably stops. A sibling ends his life. A spouse or a parent deteriorates from dementia. And you blossom, even though they're still alive. Your lifelong companion dies. You're fired from a job for no good reason, just a couple years short of retirement. A beloved is killed in a car accident. If you have experienced these kinds of tragic, life-altering disruptions, you've experienced exile because exile happens when you or I are involuntarily relocated to a place, a way of living, a way of being, for which we have no frame of reference. Exile. That's what Jeremiah is addressing in today's first reading. And in exile, even though we didn't choose to go there, we still have choices to make, choices about living, how to live, whether to live. And if we choose to live, then we have to make choices about whether we are going to survive or in time, whether we will thrive. Even in exile, when life throws us into what seems to be a God-forsaken place, even in exile, we have choices to make. And that is what Jeremiah is saying to the people. Jeremiah dares, he dares to instruct those who have been exiled to thrive. He tells them to put down roots, to cultivate life by building homes, planting gardens, having children, helping to raise children, and in time giving these sons and daughters to marriage so that they can continue to build houses and plant gardens and to thrive. Imagine how Jeremiah's instructions in this letter must have sounded to a people who had been marched 900 miles from home. They've, they've been marched away, ripped away from their routine. And Jeremiah, he is writing them 
from the war-torn rubble of Jerusalem. And he is encouraging them to come to terms with what has happened. And he says to them, he encourages them to accept what is and to make adjustments, to make adjustments that are in the service of living. It's like he's saying, okay, this is what is, and you have choices about what to do next. That is the first directive in this letter that Jeremiah is writing to the exiles. And you'll notice, right, that each of the activities that Jeremiah mentions require interacting with others. You see, thriving, even in exile, requires us to rely on one another, requires us to collaborate and cooperate. You know, building houses, planting gardens, having children and helping to raise children, increasing and not decreasing, that requires intentionality, that requires planning, that requires getting outside of ourselves and connecting with others. And you'll notice that each of these activities, building houses, planting gardens, <coughs> having and raising children, they require intentionality. They require persistence. You see, to thrive even in the midst of terrible, tragic disruptions requires grit and grace to defy the drastic disruption. You see, to pray for grit and grace to keep moving forward, even if it's just a centimeter at a time. That's what Jeremiah is writing about in today's passage. We are participants, we are co-authors in this ongoing love story with God. And every single Sunday and every day that you read the scriptures, you are reading a love story. And we're part of that. And this specific love story that we've been in with God since the beginning of time calls us not to deny what has happened in our lives, not to deny, not to deny the tragic stuff, but to keep living in spite of it. We are called, as followers of Jesus, we are called by our ancestors in the faith. We are accountable to our communion of saints to live as defiant people. And what I mean by that is defiant in terms of defying death, in terms of defying disruption. We're called to face it and to live into it. This is part of what Jeremiah is saying to the people today. To defy death, to defy trauma, to defy tragic disruptions, that's praying for the grace to keep doing what is life-giving and life-sustaining. It's about figuring out, gosh, even in the midst of this terrible tragedy, what form does life-giving, life-sustaining action take in my life or in our corporate life? What's the form that building houses or planting gardens or helping to raise children will take? 
This gritty, grace-filled defiance that I'm talking about, it doesn't mean that we don't hurt. It doesn't mean that we're not shaken by what happens in our lives. It doesn't mean that we don't grieve, that we don't rage about being catapulted into exile. What it does mean is that we work towards accepting what's happened and we choose to do what we can do to sustain and bring life into the world. And for us, as a community, congregation, it's about figuring out how do we bring life into this world, into this corner of Albuquerque, so that we also are bringing some measure of God's love into our world. And so did you catch that last phrase of Jeremiah's letter today? Seek the welfare of the city and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Seek the vitality of the city, for in its vitality you will find your vitality. Now this part of his message is just as head-spinning as the first part. He's just told the exiles, you've got a choice to make and you can thrive. <clears throat> and now he's saying in the second part, pray for the city in which you're now living. Get involved in it. Be a vital presence in it. Because your vitality and the city's vitality are interwoven. Jeremiah is speaking directly to this congregation. This letter from Jeremiah is speaking directly to us. To us who are here right now and to folks who have stopped coming or are coming as much, you know, and to people who haven't yet arrived. The message is clear. It's as clear and crisp as that blue New Mexico sky. <laughs> and the message is get involved with your city. The message is get involved. Get to know the people in your neighborhood. Remember that Sesame Street song? Who are the people in your neighborhood? Your neighborhood, right? The people that you meet when you're walking down the street. We need to get to know our neighbors. In this, in this corner of Albuquerque. Just like Jeremiah was saying to the people in 500 or so B.C., he's saying to you, he's saying to us really clearly, life is very different now. Life is very different than the way it has been. You've been building your houses. You've been building the house of, of the church. You've been planting your garden and birthing life amongst yourselves. Now it's time to get involved with your neighbors. It's very clear. The directive to this congregation is to get to know and build relationships with the neighbors. Pray, talk, imagine, look for how God is at work in this corner of the world and join this work of God. It's time to discern and learn how to cooperate with God by cooperating with others.
because of vital generosity of anonymous donors, y'all have been gifted with this stellar instrument. And likewise, because of the generosity of an anonymous donor, you're going to be getting a beautiful organ. Hey, I want to say this clearly. This is not about Fred. This is not about Edwina. This is not about pastor's present. It's not about pastor's past. This is about St. Thomas moving into a new phase of its life. If you choose, if you choose, and this new phase through music, both sacred and secular, is going to be a way that St. Thomas connects with its neighbors, is a way of reaching out and saying, come to our sanctuary. Experience the sanctuary of St. Thomas. Experience the sanctuary of beautiful sound. That regardless of the language we speak, we can be united by the language of beautiful sound. Campus ministry is not about Victor. It's not about Brad. It's not about Warren. Campus ministry is about making connections with students, staff, and faculty. It's reaching out to unchurched and de-churched people in your neighborhoods, in your workplaces. I will keep saying it. The number one reason people come to church, come back to church, check out a church, is because somebody gave them offered them a personal invitation. <clears throat> Church is a verb. Church is not a noun. Warren could tell you that the Greek word is not about a building. It is about an action of gathering. Gathering. Church is, calling. And what? Calling. And calling. The word call is in there. Yeah. Ecclesia. Come out and call. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you see, it's action. It's not, it's not a noun. Jeremiah, Jesus, St. Thomas, We need to decide if we're going to join the action that God already has going on in the world and is inviting us to participate in. Do you want to follow Jesus? Or do you just want to come worship on Sunday? How many of you will commit to adult education focusing on congregational change, the journey, the process. How many of you will commit to, to gathering together, to calling out in prayer together, so that any of our actions of outreach are centered in compassion? People of St. Are you ready to do the gritty, grace-filled work which is necessary for thriving, which is necessary for becoming a vital presence of God's love in this very broken world? I hope and pray you are, because your vitality vitality of this congregation is so interwoven with the vitality 